I'm happy to be here, happy to be able to share with you guys this morning. As Bethany already said, Jeff and the team are in Israel, so just pray for them when you think about them, that the Lord would bless their trip. Um, thankfully, we have God's word, which is unchanging, and we, we have it wherever we are, and we can dig into it and be fed by that. So I just want to start by reading from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 say, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have in our hands uh, the tool to be trained and discipled and built up in righteousness. And this morning as we look at it, uh, we can trust God's spirit to do that work in our hearts And so I'm excited um, to dig into it with you guys this morning. We're going to be in the book of James. So you can turn to James chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And so as you're turning to James chapter 4, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background on the book of James, just some information about it that will kind of guide us as we uh, look at this text this morning. The author of the book was not James the disciple, but instead James the brother of Jesus. And it's believed historically that he was probably the leader of the church in Jerusalem and was a very prominent member um, of the early church. The date of this book is probably the late 40s to 62 AD, somewhere somewhere around uh, that time period. This is around the time of the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. And some of you may remember that James played a very active role in that council. Uh, Christ was crucified between the dates of 30 to 33 AD in that time frame. And so this is 15 years or so after Jesus Christ's death, wherever you place that. So very fresh in the minds of these Jewish believers was the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can't imagine what that would have been like, you know, to have seen Jesus uh, crucified in your lifetime and see him raised again from the dead. Uh, So honestly, Again, what a treasure we have in the word of God to be able to look at this and to know that the man who wrote this and was inspired to write this, uh, that he was around during the time of Jesus' death, that he was a brother of Jesus, connected to him familiarly even. So the audience of James in verse 1 we read is to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. This is just the first verse of the book. And so James is writing to Jewish believers. The early church was was mainly comprised of, of Jews that had left their Jewish religion and practices and crowned Jesus the king of their lives and accepted him as the Messiah. So in all honesty, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish faith, but they did not see it that way. And instead, they were attacking him and and advocating for his crucifixion and death on the cross. So the Jewish believers at this time, they were scattered because of persecution that had broken out in Acts chapter 8. If you guys remember that story, Stephen is martyred by these Jews. We know that Paul, um, the apostle, was originally Saul of Tarsus, and he was advocating for these Christians' deaths. He was imprisoning them, very um, antagonistic towards this work that was happening. James would have been a believer at this time and would have been preaching and teaching, probably, in the church. So the literary style of this book, we have a lot of different literary styles in the Bible. We have some poetry. We have narrative works in the Old Testament. We have didactic kind of teaching books that are nailing down doctrine. Um, And then we have letters or epistles. And this is an epistle or a letter that was written to this broad group of believers. So instead of like the book of Romans being written specifically to the Romans or the book of Corinthians being written specifically to the Corinthian church that Paul had established, the book of James is instead written as a letter to be circulated around these different believing communities uh, in the known world at the time. And so it kind of reads a little bit more like wisdom literature. If you guys are familiar with the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, it kind of will jump around to different topics and sometimes you're reading through the chapter and it's it's not quite a whole coherent thought connected, but there's just kind of different tidbits of wisdom inserted. Uh, James is kind of similar to that. We can we can track some of the of the argument and things that he's saying, but 
there are points where he just kind of jumps to a different topic and kind of changes his thought. There's a lot of one-liners in James and just like really powerful, wise truths where you just kind of read the verse and you're like, well, well, gosh, that's kind of a complete thought in itself. Like I need to, I need to think about that for a couple weeks. Um, James is very black and white as well in the way that he communicates. He kind of says things the way that they are. He doesn't really pull any punches. Uh, and James is very interested in Christians living out what they believe. It's a book that talks a lot about taking action in our faith. There's some different themes in in James, like wisdom, money, words, and prayer, just very general uh, Christian practices and uh, aspects of our, our lives that are important, that are lived under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But probably the predominant theme is wisdom. And James, again, has this strong conviction and message that the Christian life is to be lived out practically in the things that we do. And uh, as Christians or people that are familiar with religions in the world, it can be easy to live a life that looks one way on the outside one day a week or at one point in the week. Uh, but what does the daily life look like? What, what, what is the practical bent uh, and direction of our lives? Are we... Are we really living out the things that we say? And James is very concerned about that. So it's a really convicting book and it's a hard hitting book. I'm going to read uh, first before we get into chapter four, verses 13 and 18 of chapter three, just for a little bit of context. The first part of chapter three is dealing with the tongue and James is addressing the power of our tongue and our words and how they can be used for good or evil. And then in verse 13, he's shifting and he's talking about wisdom, the wisdom of the world and then the wisdom of God. So you can follow along with me if you're there. Uh, James chapter three, verses 13 through 18 say, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so there's a huge distinction, obviously, between the wisdom of the world and then the wisdom of God, and they're really totally opposed to each other. The wisdom of the world is self-centered and self-seeking and prideful and arrogant and destructive, but the wisdom of heaven is humility. It's giving God his rightful place and crowning him as king and Lord of life. And from that experiencing the fruits of who he is, the character qualities of our God. And it's rooted in peace. We see peace mentioned several times, a couple times in those two verses there. That it is peaceful. It leads to peace. It makes peace. We, we serve a God of peace. And that's a comforting word for us in a world that is crazy and chaotic. Um, I know all of us crave and desire that heavenly wisdom, you know, as we've encountered Jesus Christ and believed in him, our hearts long for that and desire that. Unfortunately, that is not always the place that we live in our lives. And today's message I've titled warring against worldliness, because we see this contrast from verse 18 to verse one of chapter four, this tr contrast from peace to wars and fights. <laughs> And so James is kind of going to get, dig into and kind of prod our hearts in these verses. So I, the reason I'm, I'm speaking on this passage and teaching on this passage is because I have, I have felt very convicted over the last year of how easily, easily I can slip into a worldly mindset and attitude, how easily I can adopt the wisdom of the world, the mindset of the world, start pursuing the things of the world rather than the things of the Lord. I started last year in fire academy with the Grand Junction Fire Department and then it ended up getting hired on in the summer. I'm making more money than I've ever made in my life. I have a pretty comfortable schedule where I work two days at the fire department and I'm off for four days. Um, it's been a lot of change and it's just, it's easy for me to honestly start pursuing the things of the world, to start thinking about retirement 
you know, and to, to start thinking about, man, like how much time can I give off and get off and how many fun things can I go and do and vacation and uh, in the time that I have off. And those things in and of themselves are not inherently evil, but we'll see in this passage that they can very easily become that way. And they very easily become exactly the attitude of the world. And it's very convicting to see those things in your own life. We're going to talk about worldliness, but we're not going to talk about it in the context of the world and people that are unsaved and don't have a relationship with God. We're going to talk about it in the context of our own lives. How are we affected by worldliness? How, does, how is worldliness reflected in the things that we say and the things that we do? And that is what James is speaking to. He's speaking to our hearts as believers. So I pray that this is a blessing and an encouragement and exhortation to us this morning. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. This is God's heart for us as believers. He's calling us to lay our lives down for him, to sacrifice for him because he's worthy of it, because of his grace and his forgiveness, because of what we just celebrated in communion, that he gave his perfect body on the cross to forgive and cleanse us of all of our sins. And he's also calling us to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That verse has been on my heart uh, just, it seems like the Lord keeps on bringing it up over and over and over and over again, that the powerful idea that I'm not to be conformed or kind of shoved in or stuffed into the mold of the world, but rather transformed into something completely new and beautiful, a new creation in Christ. Transformed as my mind is renewed by his truth, but as it's renewed by his word. And as we, you know, are surrounded by the world, as you guys go out and work in the world, all different kinds of schedules, all different kinds of environments, different people that you're rubbing shoulders with. There is a mold and there is a pattern to the world that does not have anything to do with what we read in scripture. It is not at all the way that that God designed our lives to be or he designed the world to function. And it is rough. And we get beaten around by it. We get battered by it. And you might be in a different place as we All of us might be in different places as we look at worldliness this morning. Maybe it's something that we've really been dealing with. Maybe it's something that we've kind of grown apathetic towards. Maybe we're just discouraged and feel like we can never overcome certain things in our lives. Maybe we're really having an awesome season of reaching the world and we're and we're sensing the weight of sin and and really being a part of God's purpose and plan in it. But none of us, none of us are immune to its effects. None of us are separated from it. God called us to be in the world, not to be of the world, but to live in the world and to minister to the world. And that's his heart for us in our lives. He wants these verses to be true of us today. So I'm going to pray, open in prayer and ask the Lord to direct us. I thank you, Jesus, for your love and your grace towards us, for your mercy. And I pray that more than anything this morning, we would encounter the truth of who you are and what you have done, because it is so discouraging to be focused on who we are and what we do. And Lord, we want to be open and honest, and we, and we want to allow you and give you room to expose who we are and to tell us truly who you are and to use your word to do that. But Lord, we don't want to lose sight of who you are and what you've done. Lord, I pray that you would transform our minds and our hearts and that we would look more and more like Jesus every day. And Lord, I pray for an attitude of humility that receives your truth, receives your word, receives your instruction and desires to be changed by it and to be more like you as a result of it. We don't want to go at this Christian life alone in our own strength and power, because that's not the Christian life. That's not what you've planned. That's not what you've designed, and it doesn't lead to anything fruitful. So as we look at your word, you promise to change us through it. We know we have your spirit to lead and guide us and empower us. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would do that this morning in whatever way it is that you desire to. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. I'm just going to start by reading through the whole section of scripture. James chapter 4 verses 1 through 10 state, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. 
Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be torn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. This is a heavy, hard-hitting passage in James, and there's a lot of them uh, in James. He really doesn't pull any punches. And the first thing that kind of stuck out to me reading this passage was just how many times he uses the second person pronoun. It's 24 times total that he's either using you or your or yourself. This is a passage where he is just directly speaking to these believers' hearts. He's kind of putting their lives up there and saying, look at you. Look at what you're doing. Look at your life and what's going on in it. So they're very searching verses and a searching passage. And I think one that kind of really digs into our hearts and our lives. Verse 1 says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? He's drawing attention again to their actions and their behaviors and what he's seeing in their lives. And so it really is the first four verses where he kind of addresses this condition of the believer's lives. And then it's verses five and six that remind us of who God is and God's character and nature. And then verses seven through 10 really are kind of the solution or the cure to this worldliness. And so I titled this message Warring Against Worldliness because there's kind of this theme in this passage of worldliness, worldliness that infiltrates our lives as believers in the church at large. And so he kind of addresses like, this is what it looks like. This is what's going on. This is really what it is. This is how ugly it is. And then this is who God is in the midst of the struggle and the ugliness. And then this is the way out of that. And this is the way that you can see restoration and healing and that this worldliness, this condition in your life can be cured. So verses one through three, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so there's this contrast from the peace that we saw at the beginning or at the end of chapter three to now wars in, in, in verse one of chapter four. And the context is not outside in the world. It's here in the lives of believers. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? And so generally speaking, as he gives the answer, it's true for the world at large, but then we, we can fall into this same pattern And we can live the same way. He says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? There is no conflict ever in human history that has not had to do with selfish desires in people's hearts. That is always the source of it. It's always that people want something that somebody else has. They're covetous and so they go and take it. Or they get angry enough to kill over it and they start a war to get what somebody else has and what they want. Or maybe they're is a unified group of people that's all serving the same purpose. But as soon as there's some kind of resource that everybody wants and needs, but there's not enough of it to go around, guess what happens? I'm in and you're out. And I'm now fighting against you to get what I want and what I desire. And so it's ugly. It's ugly. It's just the sinful nature of humanity to desire and want what we want and to to go through anything to get that, to put ourselves through war, to kill other people over it. We've seen it, you know, throughout all the course of history. And even as believers, we still deal with those same fleshly attitudes and those same desires that if they go unchecked, they lead to these external actions. 
And we see over and over through Scripture that it's what's in our heart that's worked out in our lives. And so the more that that greed and envy and desire for things that we want and we crave is kind of fueled within us, it starts to pour out in actions that are antagonistic towards other people. And so we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, about anger and how, how atrocious and how evil anger really is. And that anger really, at the end of the day, is the source of murder. And so in God's eyes, you know, murder really is the same as anger and hatred. And hatred and anger is the same as murder because nobody ever kills anybody without having those hateful and antagonistic attitudes towards them. And so as James is writing this, you'll see there in verse 2 that he references you murder and covet and cannot obtain. So I think recognizing that maybe these, these believers weren't necessarily going around and murdering each other, you know, but they had hatred and anger and bitterness in their hearts to one another to the point where they were fighting each other, to the point where they were hurting each other and wounding each other. They were coveting, they are desirously wanting the things that others have that's leading them to more conflict in their lives. And again, this is happening within the church. And this war that's happening, it's like an internal war and then it's an external war. It starts in the heart with these desires that are just kind of ravenous and passionate and big and strong. Uh, I, th- I think that we've all felt, you know, we since the, since the moment we were born, we're screaming for what we want and what we desire and what we can't get for ourselves. You know, babies, from the time that we were born as babies, we have this nature that is just ravenously desirous of whatever we want and we won't stop at anything to get that. Like we still deal with that in our lives and it's wounding and hurting to other people because it comes out in these different actions of anger, hatred, murder, covetousness, all of these things. And so he goes on and he says, you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And then verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. I kind of see building in these verses like this building frustration that there's kind of this monster of desire that wants what it wants and won't stop at anything to get it. So you act on it and you're angry with somebody. You start a conversation that you wish you hadn't of. You're fighting and warring to try to get what you want. And the result of that is what? You don't get what you want. (laughs) you end up like more beat up and feeling probably worse than you did before. Like that was not the solution. That wasn't the answer. You fought and you warred and you tried to obtain it, but you could not obtain. The next thing that happens is he says you do not have. He says you do not have. He recognizes that you guys don't have. You have this desire for something that you're just not getting. That's the reason you're fighting for it. You do not have because you do not ask. And instead of asking for something, we like to try to take things. And I think it's interesting that in this passage, uh, God doesn't tell us that the answer is to stop desiring or wanting things. He doesn't say, oh, you wicked, evil people, why do you desire or want anything? That's so wrong. That's so dirty. That's so evil. God built us with desires. God built us with desires so that he could fill those desires. God wants us to come to him and ask him. And so there's this arrogant mentality that says, I'm independent. I can do what I want. I can get what I want. And it's very prevalent in our society and especially in our influential or sorry, affluential society, rich society, where we really can pretty much go out and get whatever we want. There's not really much of a sense of dependence, depending on other things, depending on other people. And that leads to fueling this desire that, well, I'm just going to take and I'm going to get what I want in my life. So John chapter 16, verse 24, is an incredible word from Jesus himself to us. John 16, 24, uh, is John speaking to his disciples. And he says, until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Jesus is literally saying, guys, like, ask me, ask me for things in, in, in your life. Ask me to meet and fill desires. Ask me. Come to me and ask. And so often we don't ask. We don't ask the Lord. But there's even a more building frustration because sometimes, sometimes we do. We say, okay, well, I'm just going to pray about it. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to ask the Lord for this thing that I need or I really want in my life. It's not a bad, terrible, awful thing. Like it's something that, you know, God enjoys and loves or created or made. And so we sit down and we ask God for it. And then what does he say? He says, You ask and do not receive. You do not receive. After asking, 
because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so then the frustration even builds more. It's like, oh God, like you tell me to ask you for things and I'm asking you and I'm not getting the things that I want. And then we're even more frustrated and we're even more angry and our flesh even rears up more. And now it's mad and it's angry at God. And now we're fighting and waging war against the God who made us, the God who loves us. And so in regards to these verses, application-wise, I, I think we can search our hearts and we can ask, what are we desiring? Like, what are you desiring in your life? What is that desire? That, that desire can be for something good. That desire can be for something evil as well. But we need to search that out. We need to search out what is the desire. We need to take that to the Lord. We need to ask Him for discernment and wisdom. We need to go to His Word and let Him tell us whether that's something of Him or not. And if, and if it's something good or bad, we can ask the second question, how are you going about getting that thing that you desire? Because in these verses, we see that it's taking and grabbing and fighting and warring and this frustrated, you know, like little kid inside of me that just is fixated on this one thing and will stop at nothing to get it. It's like this monstrous kind of animalistic attitude. Or there's a patient attitude and a trusting attitude, a dependent attitude that will actually go to God and ask him to fill or meet that desire. And so I want to read some verses from Psalms that talk to us about our desires and about God meeting them. Psalm 145. Psalm 145 verses 15 through 19 is a beautiful passage that speaks of God's heart towards us. And we get this picture into David's relationship with God, a man after God's own heart. And the way that he looked at his desires, the way that he looked at God meeting those desires in his life Psalm 145 verse 15 says, The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. Just beautiful words concerning the the Lord's heart to meet our desires, to satisfy those desires. The entire world ultimately is looking to him. Whether we are doing that intentionally or not, whether we're trying to live independently or not, we are completely dependent. (laughs) You know, there's not a thing that we have or we receive that doesn't come from God and his goodness. Why would we not run to him? Psalm 36, Psalm 36 verses 7 through 8 also speak to these desires. They say, how precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. Verse 8 there specifically, they are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. We can be abundantly satisfied in the Lord and being with him and dwelling with him. And he gives us drink from the river of his pleasures. I think that's just a very interesting phrasing and wording that he uses. That as we draw closer to the Lord and as we're living to please him and serve him with our lives, his pleasure is actually a river that we drink from and we're satisfied from and our pleasures are met and our desires are filled as the Lord is pleased. Psalm 16, verse 11. So the last verse here relating to this topic. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Eternal fulfillment, eternal pleasures satisfied in God. He, he and only he has the desire, to, has the ability to satisfy those insatiable desires of the human heart. There's nothing else that will do it. And James is clear about saying that as we go back to James chapter 4 with this frustration that's building. Like you can try. You can try and people have for millennia have tried to seek anything and everything under the sun to meet these desires. And they haven't gone to God, the one that created them and the only one that can truly meet those desires. How easy it is, I've found in my life, to fall into the same thought process of the world. And so this is a picture really of worldliness is letting these desires kind of govern and control our lives, leading us to war and fight against others and against God himself. Because if you look at verse four, this is like 
this is the the proclamation of of where where this ends up. This is the big um, the big statement regarding our position when we're in, when we're in this place. Verse four says, "Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God." This is a very bold statement that James makes concerning believers who have drifted to set their affections on other things that aren't of the Lord and have decided to side with, side with the world and say, I'm going to do things the, wor- the world's way. I'm going to fight in war and claw my way to get what I want or what I think I need or what I don't have. I'm going to let those desires govern and control my life. I'm not going to ask God for those things. I'm going to try to get those things on my own. Or I'm going to try to use God for my own benefits and pleasures. And it's kind of like, Man, why, why in the world would, would God give us the very things that are going to pull our hearts away from, from him and take us away from him? So sometimes those desires that we have are not at all in line with what he wants to give. They're not at all in line with what is best and right for our lives. And that's a hard pill to swallow, but I think we swallow it and we understand it when we understand the heart of God, the love of God. He uses this terminology of adultery. And so he's referencing this picture of marriage that he's instituted in our daily lives, which is beautiful because it's a very big part of our lives and it helps us to understand what our relationship with God actually is. God has made covenants and promises to us. And we look throughout the Old Testament and we're kind of going to reference the Old Testament as we talk about this spiritual adultery. God made covenants and promises to his people. He gave himself to his people and he asked that just in exchange they would give themselves to him. And that's exactly what marriage is. It's two people giving themselves completely to the other person. And that's the covenant. And it's based on love. It's based on a desire for one another. And that is what God desires with us. That's, what, that's what's happened in our lives. If you've believed in Jesus and put your faith in him, you are married to God in a sense, married to Jesus. You have this deep, intimate relationship and connection to God, just like the people of Israel did. But if you look through the Old Testament, and I pray that this is kind of a plug and an encouragement to read through the Old Testament, it is so powerful and it is so indicative of our own lives. As you read through it, you see this history of God's relationship with people. You see his relationship with individual people. You see his relationship with nations and big groups of people. And every single page, you see the faithfulness, the goodness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. You have a lot of judgment of God mixed in there as well because God has a holy and a righteous standard and a right way for people to live. And he's not going to let people get away with living in sin and in a way that's going to destroy and pull them away from what will truly satisfy and give them life. But you see this relationship, this beautiful relationship with God and his people. And it's ugly. I mean, honestly, like pick up the Old Testament and read through these pages. It is ugly. (laughs) The people of God did some ugly, terrible, wicked things. But you know what? I look at my life and I've done those things too. And as we look at this passage and our tendency to struggle with worldliness and to drift away from the Lord, like, I've done those things too. Like Israel was unfaithful. I am unfaithful in my heart. My heart can be so divided. My heart can be so attached to worship things that are not God, to worship things, people, desires, feelings. I can just put those things in a more prominent place than God. And that is essentially what this adultery is. The people of God cheat. We cheat on God. And instead of giving our hearts and our lives fully to God, we give them over to other things. And let's read John, 1 John, sorry, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 speaks to this attitude of worldliness, this drifting away from the Lord in our hearts, this infatuation and love, love for the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 say, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So speaking to this love for the world, 
We can't have a divided love in our lives. We're either loving God or we're loving something else. Like it just doesn't work. And I've, you know, I've tried in my Christian life, I feel like to love both. And it just, it does not work. It's, and again, marriage, like think of marriage. How does that work in marriage? How are you married to two people and you're giving everything to two people? It is impossible. That is not the way God designed it. I mean, it's not even natural. And so why would I think that in my heart, I can somehow live in that divided place? And that really is what James is speaking to here as he references this adultery. And I'm going to read from Jeremiah as well. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. This is just one instance where God is addressing his people, the nation of Israel, and a point where they had drifted away from him. As you read through the Old Testament, they did it over and over and over and over again. So this is just one instance, but gives us a picture of God's heart for his people. Um, and just this picture of being married to them and them turning away and being unfaithful to him. So Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 7 through 10 say, And I said, this is God talking, speaking through Jeremiah. And I said, after she had done these things, after Israel had done these things, return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. We'll just stop there. This adultery that they committed against God was with things that God had created. And we see that in Romans, if you read Romans chapter 1, it really gives the depiction of the world, a fallen world that's rebelled against God. Basically, God is who he says he is. He does the things he says he does. He created everything. And we instead have chosen to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. We've, ser- we've chosen to serve and worship things that he's made rather than God himself, which is what the nation of Israel did time and time and time again. And it really is, it's more evil than the world going out and sinning against God. Because the world's not married to God. So there's, there's something that really, like, really, I think, digs into the heart of a believer when you say, you know what? I, like, committed to be faithful to this God, yet I'm being unfaithful in my life. Like, I made that commitment to him. And I'm, I'm not honoring that commitment. It, it, it creates animosity. It, you know, it can't not. And I think those are harsh words, you know? We talk about the love of God all the time, but we don't really talk about his righteous anger. And I think that makes sense in this context of marriage. It's like, how can somebody that's been cheated on as, you know, as good and loving as maybe as they are, how can they not be angry and hurt and wounded and frustrated by adultery, that, that unfaithfulness? And God is in his holy, in his holy person and character. It's not, um, it's not a chill thing for God at all. It's something that that wounds and hurts that relationship and has to because you can't be, as James says here, if you look at back, back at verse 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So very hard hitting and you know it should be in our lives. It should be. But we move into verse 5 and verse 6 and this is where just... I pray that that God really ministers to your heart in these verses because this is the heart of God. We kind of shift from this is our position and this is the condition of our hearts that can wander and stray from the Lord and be filled with worldliness to verse 5 and 6 that that explain God's heart. And again, you see this throughout all of the Old Testament. It is incredible how patient and loving and faithful God is to people that sin against him. He says in verse 5, Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We see here in verse 5 that God is jealous. God is a jealous God. And jealousy, there is a holy and a righteous jealousy. Jealousy can be evil and wrong if it's under the wrong motivation and self-seeking and self-serving. But there's a jealousy of God that is absolutely righteous and absolutely holy. And again, we see it in the, in the covenant of marriage, in that relationship. We see jealousy as a very prominent thing. 
I don't think you can truly love somebody and not be jealous for their attention and their life. I've been dating Emily for the past five months or so. We recently got engaged and are entering into that new season. So thanks. We're really excited about that. God is really good and gracious. And there have been so many times in our relationship where we, we kind of joke around. Well, not really. Sometimes we're not joking. Um, <laughs> we say like, man, you're, you're so hard to share. Like, I don't like sharing you with other people. I don't like, you know, sharing your, your time and your attention with other people. Like, I want all of that for myself. Like, I think when you fully, when you really love somebody, there's just a, a desire for them, for their time, for their attention to be with them. And, and when that's given away to other things or other people, you get jealous and that's like, that's a natural thing. That's not a wrong thing. That's, that's a good thing. And that is God's heart towards us as these people that he made, these people he loves, these people, you know, that he gave himself to in marriage. Guys, it's not just a mechanical contract or somebody forcing or obligating God to do that. He absolutely does not have to do that. But he is loving. He is love. He desires that. And he desires you. He desires your heart. He desires your life. And so in the midst of worldliness and idolatry and adultery, turning away to something else, God is angry and God's mad because he's jealous. That's part of it. That is part of it. He's like, my gosh, I want that heart. I made that heart. I designed that heart. It's for me. I want to fill it. I want to meet the needs in those hearts. Those hearts that are out there in those lives. That is what God wants. That's what God wants from each of you guys. I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> or, um, I mean, there's not really any good reason for God to want that in us. But he does. Like, he wants that. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your life. He wants all of it. He's not going to settle for not having all of it. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9 is just a reference for this jealousy of God. It's kind of um, a reiteration of Exodus chapter 20 when God gives the Ten Commandments. Can, Ten Commandments to Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. This is God speaking. He's speaking um, to idolatry and, and not bowing down to serve false gods. He says, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. God is jealous. God was jealous for the nation of Israel. <laughs> And he's jealous uh, for you and your heart and your life, especially as you have made that decision to believe in Jesus Christ and you've entered into that covenant with him. He's not going to let you out of that. His spirit is going to keep convicting you. And as much as I in my life have pushed that down and can push down that conviction and continue on this path of drifting away from him, he is constantly there and he's reaching out and he He'll throw roadblocks in the way and things that will stop me from going down that path because he loves me and he wants me. He loves us. He wants us. Verse six, such an encouraging verse, but he gives more grace. This God that we serve is a gracious God and he is more gracious than the deepest, darkest sin in our lives. The interesting thing is that I, I feel like this verse that I'm going to reference next, Romans chapter five, verse 20. It means more to me the more that I have sinned against God and the more that I have failed him, I think it has a deeper and a richer meaning. And it's not an encouragement to sin in our lives, but it's the reality of the grace that God has poured out. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And the reason I say that is that the more I realize how dark and ugly and dirty my sin is, and the more prevalent I see that it is in my heart. And as God, you know, draws us closer, we start to see like more and more areas maybe that are sinful, more and more areas that aren't aligned to his will. And it burdens our hearts. And we see just how, how deep and dark sin is. And it's, it's kind of like this mountain growing up that I'm kind of seeing is like, oh, you know, I thought my sin was down here, but now it's getting up here. Like, gosh, that's really high. Like, how can anybody overcome that? The more that I see that, the more I realize, oh my gosh, God's grace abounds more than that. <laughs> like God's grace is higher. As high as that sin goes, God's grace is higher, infinitely more high than my sin. Like there is nothing in me that could overcome God. Why would I think that sin or anything else in the world could overcome God and his grace and his mercy? It abounds towards us. It abounds more than that sin. It is always there. It's always available. 
And unlike other religions in the world that say you need to get your life together and your act together, you need to climb that mountain, you need to attack that mountain, you got to beat down that sin and that garbage so you can get up to God. God says, I defeated the mountain. Don't worry about the mountain. You can never get over that mountain. You will never make any ground if you're trying to face your sin on and attack it and defeat it in your own power. I defeated it on the cross. I paid the price for your sin. I am gracious and merciful and I will lift you up over that mountain if if you'll come to me, if you'll admit your condition, and then if you will turn in repentance and in humility, because we read right after this, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I don't know if you've ever realized that in scripture, but there's one thing God resists. It's not the murderer. It's not the adulterer. It's not the any anything. I mean, the deepest, darkest sin in the world. It's not... Hitler is always a huge example for us. Um, There have been some really evil, dark, nasty, dirty sins and lifestyles in the world. But you're not going to find a verse in the scripture that says, well, I resist, I resist that. I resist that. There's nothing that can, can make, can draw that person to me. The thing that he resists is pride. And all those people, don't get me wrong, all those people and all those sins, they're rooted in pride, but pride in and of itself that is what God resists. And the reason for that is that it's the pride, the proud person. You maybe know somebody like this in your life that is just, they're never wrong. They're never wrong. You can have any conversation with them, any situation. They're just never wrong. Even if they do things that are totally wrong, they will never admit it. They'll never admit that they're the problem. They'll never admit that they're going the wrong direction. They just keep stubbornly doing what they're doing. They're just living in their own world. And that is the thing that God just can never, he can never work with that. So as long as the human heart is proud and arrogant and stubborn in its own ways of selfishness, it's just going to be resisting God and going its own way. And it's not going to experience the grace and mercy of God. So contrast that with the broken sinner who has committed whatever sin, fill in the blank, in his life and is broken over that sin, admitting that he's the problem, casting himself on the mercy and grace of God. He's going to find grace and mercy and forgiveness and restoration because that's the grace of God. That's what it's all about. That's what God's about. That's what God wants to do in our lives. But it can't happen without that humility taking place. And so really, we see here this transition into the solution and that the solution to the worldliness in our lives is humility before God. It's recognizing who God is, who we are, and humbling ourselves before him because God resists the crowd, the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so here are James's words of wisdom and exhortation for us in verses seven through 10. Remember, James is a man of action. He likes to talk about what we can do. And honestly, these are just, these are actions that will flow out of that broken and contrite and humble heart before God. And it's a place that I wish I could say I never left, but I leave it all the time. I leave that humble place in my heart and I wander around and I get, you know, my desires and um, affections mixed up and messed up. Verse seven says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. There's a bunch of different actions in here, eight of them total, and there's some promises as well. So I'm just going to read it again. Submit to God is the first action. The second one is resist the devil. And then there's this conditional promise attached to it. Resist the devil. The promise is he will flee from you. Amen. Draw near to God. The promise is that he will draw near to you, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's speaking to that adultery and worldliness in our lives. We can be double-minded or we can be torn in different directions. He's saying, no more. Single-minded focus and heart on me. And then verse 9, it's okay to be sad and broken in our lives. And to be sad and broken over sin is a sign of humility. It's a sign of repentance. And we can't earn God's forgiveness by being as sad as we can possibly be or making that happen. But I think that when we really humble ourselves before the Lord and we really see who he is, we really see who we are and what he's done for us, it it has to break our heart. 
because our hearts are, are tethered to him by love and this covenant that he has made with us and that we have made with him lament and mourn and weep. Let, allow it to happen. Allow your laughter to be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And then verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and the last promise, he will lift you up. He promises that the devil will flee from us. He promises that he will draw near to us and he promises to lift us up. He promises those things as we humble ourselves before him. He wants to do these works in our lives. And verse 10 is interesting. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. It's like it's an action that we take. It's not something that he's going to do for us, but something that he asks us to do. He asks us to, to lay down, you know, lay down the desires, lay down the wants, lay down ourselves, lay down uh, the course of life that we're traveling and embrace what he has for our lives.